welcome to a brand new episode of Business PNG. Now recently in Manila, Philippines, the Business PNG team attended the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission meetings, an annual event in which commission members gather to discuss the Pacific's most valuable resource, tuna. Fisheries Minister Patrick Bassa, along with a large delegation from Papua New Guinea, joined delegates from Pacific nations and fishing powers such as Europe, China, and the United States of America at the 14th regular session of the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission in the Philippines last week. Their task? To set the rules for the world's biggest fishery. The WCPFC is an international body that governs fishing activity particularly for highly migratory tuna. The Commission's annual meetings are aimed at developing conservation and management measures for the tuna stock. Our critical discussions on tropical tuna, illegal fishing, observer safety and curbing transshipment at sea were the key topics at this year's meeting. For us, for the Commission, the main uh, topic uh, this session is the tropical tuna measure, a replacement bridging tropical tuna measure which governs the uh, management of the tuna longline and purse saint fisheries, which is of uh, great importance to Pacific Island countries. We are, however, also looking for a uh, management measure with regard to southern albacore. Uh, and then there are a number of other quite important measures, but it's tropical tuna that, that certainly is the most important, and we do want to make progress on southern albacore issue as well. The tropical tuna measure sets fishing rules and influences how benefits flow for tuna worth more than 4.4 billion US dollars a year. The current measure which covers skipjack, big eye and yellowfin tuna is due to expire at the end of the year. Papua New Guinea, a member of the commission and the second largest tuna producer amongst the Pacific Island countries, had a seat at the table and urged the commission to focus on its main mandate to manage fishing efforts in the high seas and to address the issue of disproportionate burden resource-owning countries like PNG face in putting conservation measures into effect. The Western and Central Pacific is home to the world's largest tuna fishery, yielding 56% of the total catch in 2016. Most of the largest tuna fleets in the world operate in the WCPFC convention area. Fisheries Minister Patrick Bassa emphasized Papua New Guinea's position that the zone-based measures that have delivered economic benefit to Pacific nations should not be undermined. Um, some of the issues currently drafted on the, um, this bridging measures it's got some, it may have some impact on, on the island states in, in terms of implementations and the, uh, and the burden on, on those uh, implementations of those measures which we felt that we should bring it forward for the Commission to consider and look for an easy way where both the Pacific Island countries and the fish, distant fishing nations should play a role and do cuts where we can save the fishing. After a grueling five-day meeting, negotiations about tropical tuna measures finally concluded in the early hours of Friday morning. Countries agreed to a tropical tuna bridging measure to replace the current agreement which expires on December 31st. Countries agreed to wait for 12 months for further scientific stock assessments in 2018 to determine further management measures of the purse saint fishery, high seas purse saint effort control, and big eye catch limits in the longline fishery. This includes a fish aggregating device's closure for five months on the high seas and three months in national fishing zones. Other key features of the agreement were measures designed to ensure stocks are maintained at recent average levels and capable of producing maximum sustainable yield, a harvest strategy for Pacific bluefin tuna fisheries, a more effective standard for e-reporting of fishing vessel observer data. Members worked really hard, not just at this meeting, but over the last 18 months, to come to this meeting prepared to adopt a new tropical tuna measure. And it wasn't the only issue that the Commission was dealing with this year, but it was definitely one of the key issues because the existing tropical tuna measure expires at the end of this month. 
So it was a lot of hard work, a lot of good cooperation and engagement by members, and in the end, a good result for the Commission. Another good outcome for the Commission this year was the adoption of a, re a rebuilding plan for Bluefin Tuna. Bluefin Tuna has been, is a stock that has been at critically low levels for a number of years now. It is under the management purview of the Northern Committee, and this year, with good leadership by Japan, the Northern Committee recommended some recommendations that have a reasonable chance of rebuilding the bluefin tuna stock within the next 10 to 15 years. So the Commission adopted those measures. We had good progress on harvest strategy. Members are committed to continuing to develop the framework for harvest strategies. A lot of work is ongoing. I'm Ian Girari in Manila, and you're watching Business PND. Two years after the groundbreaking of the 95 million kina construction phase of the Pacific Marine Industrial Zone, the Medang Base project is yet to see any construction. This has caused skeptics to question whether the project will ever see the light of day. Papua New Guinea's Fishing Industry Association has warned that the vision for PNG to be the tuna hub of the Pacific will be dead unless action is taken to save it. The multi million Kina Pacific Marine Industrial Zone in Medang is a key part of the vision, but it has since seen a delay in construction. Recently in Manila at the 14th Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, the association said the project has the potential to compete with fisheries-rich nations like Philippines and Vietnam, but lack of dialogue with stakeholders is holding the progress hostage. I think if we can come back and uh, probably uh, uh, create some awareness and education to our policy makers to say that, see, we've come this far, this uh, is a uh, working policy. We don't have to throw it into the bin if, it, if, if they consider it not working, but we bring it back to the table to fine-tune it and say, okay, but Let's look at another five, ten years down the line, or 15 years <coughs> down the line. That's how we're going to get there. Now, what are the measures that in, uh, support uh, policy and investment and nationalization plans should be in place? That should be that road that we, 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 we as uh, stakeholders should be participating and discussing on around the table. Eh? I, think, I think in our world, sometimes we come here and then we, see, we, we sit behind each other in the delegation uh, being the tables as one team and the industry and our government representatives. But when we go back home, they, we sit across the table and they see as competitors or, or uh, an enemy. Mm. If we're going to go down this uh, long-term uh, road, we should be looking at each other as strategic partners. At the launch of the project's 95 million Kina construction phase, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill stated that the Pacific Marine Industrial Zone in Medang would earn the country between 6 billion and 12 billion kina a year once fully developed. The initial financial investment decision by the Exim Bank of China was stalled by the lengthy court battle with Medang environmental NGOs, as well as pressing landowner issues delaying the construction. However, a review of government management and expenditure on the long-awaited project has revealed a 30 million kina expenditure including a 4 million kina expenditure on the main gate alone, according to Trade, Commerce and Industry Minister Wera Mori. The lack of progress on the project has led skeptics to believe the project will never see the light of day. According to Association Treasurer Fabian Chow, the project is going nowhere fast unless the government of the day speaks to the right people. In Madang, after the success stories, a PMIZ that's going nowhere fast, that people are talking big stories, but nothing's going to happen. You're talking about a 350 million kina, US dollars, investment that's just going to be wasted because no one wants to come there because things have changed. And that intelligence response we had to bring in the market players over these last 20 years, no one seems to be listening, no one seems to know that 
something's changed. The last three years have been a disaster. If current policies continue, it's dead. Nothing's going to happen. But it's been a great dream. It's got great potential if it's done right. But nothing's being done right right now because no one is taking a long-term vision to say, let's enable the industry players to make a profit out of this. A profit on their rate of capital, on their risk, and the years they have to put up with at making a loss before they break into profit. You know, industry players are willing to take a long-term view if there's light at the end of the tunnel and certainty in the regulatory framework and certainty in the fiscal conditions they're going to work in. The National Fisheries Authority has admitted that the progress is slow, even seeing a transferal of the project between government agencies, first from Department of Trade, Commerce and Industry, then to Kumul Holdings, and recently back to the Department of Trade, Commerce and Industry, under the leadership of Minister Weramori. I would not give you any update, but the idea of PMIZ is a good one. It basically uh, follows the, um, the desire by our Pacific leaders that they're looking for a hub in which um, Pacific Islands could use as a processing hub and, uh, and catapult from the overseas. Unfortunately, the progress on that is pretty slow under the Department of Commerce. Um, recently, it was shifted to um, Kumul Holdings and again shifted back to um, um, Commerce. And the progress, in fact, it's, through, it's, it's getting too long and the interest by small Pacific Island to come in is slowly eroding. And we should seriously actually make it happen. Uh, now that the uh, more fishing will be done around the Pacific Islands because there's growing fleets, I think it's only important for us to move forward on that. I'm Mary Batulo. This is Kokopo, East New Britain Province, and you're watching Business PNG. The Bank of PNG and CEFI's financial inclusion project has now reached those in prison as well. 20 inmates from the Vanimo Correctional Center have recently graduated along with 3,000 other graduates at the Vanimo Green River District. Vanimo Green River is one of the four districts in West Sipic Province. It houses the provincial capital, Vanimo. About 4,000 people live in Vanimo town, while the bulk of the population live on the outskirts of Vanimo and in villages. Almost 100% of the province's economy is generated through the logging sector. Landowners are paid royalties by logging companies, while others work at the eight different logging companies. But not many people who receive royalty payments know how to save money or budget what they earn. Most of the people need to be aware of the uh, finance institutions that they can, you know, obtain services from. And uh, there are a lot of challenges in the country in terms of what's happening, in terms of the, you know, many, many schemes that are available and uh, people are unaware of the services that are available, you know, at the banks, especially licensed finance institutions. And so, uh, you know, we have a privilege of uh, submitting a proposal to the Bank of PNG, uh, especially through the MEP uh, program. and. Uh, who are implementing the, uh, the national government's uh, national strategy on financial inclusion and uh, that sort of stuff. Francis Napri comes from Wutong, the last village along the northern PNG in the nation border. He has been benefiting from royalties from logging companies for over 20 years. 
However, Francis did not know how to use the money wisely and did not understand what savings or budgeting was. Time we play exchange in school or planty blow me play. He opened my account one time, number one super. And planty now all got savings now and then number one super. Planty deposit now stop. I think I'm um, school, I'm um, nice law school, I'm good. And um, that's all the thing I'm doing, also I'm talking first time, also I'm coming late. When we play music and water, planting money, we play action, go to the batas. Over the money, we play go spend the batas. Now planting money, also music, or music and water. Francis is amongst 115 others in his village that participated in this 10-day training. Despite its village situated at the gateway to PNG, not many people in Wutong engage in businesses that promote PNG products or make money to invest in a bigger business. Me one blah blah this last selected one me come at the name Mr. Course now. Me am almost true. Because I'm true, Mr. Vincent Calabus now. I'm kind of planning something outside of freedom. Godwin Melendu also comes from Wutong. He was convicted and sentenced to two years imprisonment. Godwin received the training while he was serving his sentence at the Vanimo Correctional Center. He says he is fortunate to receive basic financial knowledge and wants to start up his little business. So this life and cost me kissing me come outside me can help me at law sem continue this life one kind of so narrow life stuff outside the freedom. So me almost true. Now now me come to la no this like graduation. I make sure people have me. So me got some la idea lo on a kind way but me can look out to me yet we buy can help me lo life blow me. There were 34 separate trainings that were conducted in the four LLGs by Horizon Consulting over a space of six months. The financial institutions that supported the training include Bank of South Pacific and Number One Super. Training uh, participants, there are total different uh, participants. Uh, the inmates uh, from uh, one more uh, correctional services. And the schools, a lot of our primary schools, our high schools, our secondary schools here in the province are interested. And uh, we just focus on here, one more green district. The schools like St. Ignatius and Aitapia High School, they send in invitation for us to go and conduct the training, but we cannot make it because we already have with 3,000 participants. So. Leo Manafat, who is the project officer, explains that most people in the informal sector do not make money to save. Most of the money they make is spent again, and many do not practice a savings culture. Poro, poro presa, want to presa. No, na plenty money, don't blame black sim, me blame sim long long. Na lo budget, na savings, lo good la time, la time lo good me blame no save. La time me blame since la training, me blame feel mo save me alright. No, as a team la lo time lo good na good la time lo me blame. Following the training, the participants were able to open their bank accounts and had a wider knowledge on accessing basic financial information from banks. I have to send me feeling me time after the school or send time is a certificate by me can ask a kiss him long to do some the school me kiss him and he bring me low close to the bank low where waste low me can loan and at least to send me I got gold me got gold outside where me got think thing long where me pine hard low said by help me but me come to this last school now training me see now me save low way blow up and me must the participants receive their certificates 
in a mass graduation in Vanimo last month. We are able to tell the people about, you know, uh, all four money schemes and blacklisted institutions and that kind of stuff. So we have internal knowledge of the, uh, of the, of the, of the bank and what they do. And I think that's one thing that uh, people appreciated in terms of our delivery. And we were able to uh, discourage people from, uh, you know, following fast money schemes, pyramid schemes and that kind of stuff. So I think that's one strength. And uh, we have a team. The training is part of BPNG's aim to teach ordinary Papua New Guineans the importance of savings and budgeting. It was first conducted in the Highlands region and is slowly expanding to other provinces. It's not a small project. The project has a value of uh, 20, 27 million US dollars. Um, it focused mainly on financial education for a lot of people with, with low incomes. But there's been other, other components of the project that we also delivered, and they're quite significant in itself. You will also note that we have the income life and the income cycle that you have, and you have to plan your money within that cycle so that you are able to get that money and have it for the next six, seven months until the next crop harvest comes on. Because if you do not manage that money properly, uh, you know, you're going to lose out on a lot of things in between. Because you might not be able to have access to school. Your kids might not be able to go to school because you're not able to pay the school fees. And that's all we have for this episode of Business PNG. For more information, or if you would simply like to view this episode again, visit MTV online at the URL at the bottom of your screen. Or to simply join the conversation, like our page on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at the Twitter handle at BusinessPNG. Until next week, have a pleasant evening. I'm Leanne Girari and this was Business PNG.